That's what a real woman looks like right there. Look at that. Beautiful. Okay, here we go. Patch 1.2, named Mysteries of Moradon, was World of Warcraft's first content patch, releasing only six weeks after the base game on the 18th of December 2004. It introduced Moradon, a large new yep. dungeon that bulked out Desolus, focusing in on the origin lore of the Centaur, where Zatar, yep. son of Cenarius, and Veridus's pairing resulted in the creation of the entire Centaur race. And Wait, what? Large new dungeon that bulked out Desolus, focusing in on the origin lore of the Centaur, where Zatar, son of Cenarius, and Veridus's pairing resulted. Pairing? On the origin lore of the Centaur, where what? Zatar, son of Cenarius, and. Th Can you imagine how disappointed Cenarius must be? His kid's out there fucking, like, f fat ass rocks, man. Like, what the hell? What the fuck, man? I didn't even know this. Eridus's pairing resulted in the creation of the entire centaur race. Oh and my now, god. Many years later, Moradon is the center of her grief. This was a large three wing dungeon intended for wow. players between levels 40 and 49, with the three wings being spread across that level bracket. It and the quest that came along with it heavily bolstered the gameplay and the lore of Desolus in Western Kalimdor, I, a place that shit. without this patch's contents was definitely a good bit closer to unfinished. Okay. Realistically, it's quite easy to argue that Moradon was really intended for launch and miss the deadline, but this was a wildly different era, and World of Warcraft shipped with more content than really anyone could have burnt through that quickly. Yeah. Even leveling to 60 at maximum speed with heavy optimizations, which very few people did at this time, took about six whole days slash played. It's Many players time. took months to get through the game, rather than the days that we're used to now. While Blizzard was certainly cutting it close with content, like with the raids of patch 1.1, this right. was a substantial addition especially given how difficult and sprawling the higher level dungeons of World of Warcraft were. Holy As we'll shit. later see with this series in the future patches, dungeons in the game were truly designed to be adventures. Information on them was- That's the way it used to be, dude. I love that. Like, I don't like how dungeons now are just designed to be speedrun. They started doing this on like BC. And like nowadays, all the dungeons are like designed with Mythic Plus in mind. And I wish that we had dungeons like Maradon, dungeons like BRD, and these other larger dungeons that are more expansive and it feels like you're actually going into something rather than just basically going through a loot simulation with like certain fights. It just feels like much more of a game. And like the old dungeons, Mechagon, Mechagon is really big. It is. I think Mechagon is almost... Is is Mechagon? I I don't know. I mean, like, it's there. Yeah, it's, it's there. It, Mechagon is good. Okay, like I, I don't want to rule out Mechagon, but Mechagon is is also like a very linear dungeon in the same way. Besides the first three bosses, so I just like to see more dungeons like BRD, like more very very large mega dungeons, not just eight bosses. So you can take two of the wings and make them mythic plus dungeons, but uh, like actual like large scale dungeons sparse, and the game itself usually offer no more than a quest chain teasing the lore and setting up the enemy. Yep. And given the freeform design and the varying utility of the classes in the game at this time, it was a much less tailored experience, one that varied wildly from party to party. You and your friends would have yep. your own story to tell based on how your group faced the challenges within, and that's part of what made the dungeon delving experience of early World of Warcraft so darn memorable. This was the first major addition to the game, and it was the first time that many new or younger players will have booted up a game and actually found it to be different. In this case, sure, it was nothing extreme, but this would have been a relatively new experience to a lot of players in the early That's 2000s. That's actually a good point. While players opened the launcher to have yeah. a sizable download and a list of, of things that were changed and new, a free update right. to the game, one that fixed loads of teething issues and added a whole new dungeon. This came at a good time too, as the subscription cost on top 
top of a full-priced release, that was asking for quite a lot. Of course, World of Warcraft had so much content that that was entirely justified, but this kind of patch really would have alleviated people's fears. Their subscription cost was clearly not going to waste, and it does in fact give you this access to a changing and evolving world, getting better only a few weeks after launch. This was the major feature of patch- I guess that would be kind of crazy for people back then, right? Because like back in the day, like you just fucking play Counter-Strike and then eventually they'd bring out a new Counter-Strike, but, or like, you know, you play Mario and eventually there's a new Mario that comes out. But besides that, I mean, there's not really a whole lot else to it. And so like you, you think about like EverQuest, well, there, there are many of them that, you know, didn't play EverQuest, for example. And so like, yeah, I feel like that would be very different for like most people. Like WoW was a lot of people's first MMORPG. For people asking, I wasn't really planning on doing Mythic EP today, uh, since Classic is coming right back out, and uh, I was kind of waiting. I know that some people have been asking about that in my raid team that we were doing. Uh, I'm not planning on doing it today, uh, since Classic's just going to be out in a couple of days. I need to take a piss. I will be right back, and we'll start the video again, okay? And thank you again, guys, for everything today. I really, I fucking do appreciate it, man. Let's get this back. 1.2, but there were two other headliners. First off, right. cloaks and helms could now be hidden from the interface menu. Ooh, now, this was a feature that good. many made use of, given how badly cloaks like were clipped, and how helms would hide most of the decisions made during character creation. Yep. Fundamentally, though, this was Blizzard reacting so if you to fucked player up during character creation, you just put on a helmet. Further change their experience to make it their own, and this is a trend that largely did define this era. Given how this was implemented in a rather inelegant way, simply being a checkbox in the interface menu, well, I guess substance overstyle help to find the game at this era too. That for it years, really that's was fine. Thinking of a solution and I, I have a problem with that. It. Then the next major feature in 1.2 was an event, the Feast of Great Winter, just in time for the real world Christmas. And Ooh. I don't think I need to explain how magical Iron Forge would have looked fully decked out with holly and the decorative trees at this time. A magnificent experience for those new to online games, despite not being very serious. You can so I think like, that was one of the things is like nowadays everybody just kind of like expects the this shit to happen but whenever we're looking at like this old stuff there's a lot of people that are probably thinking to themselves oh this isn't a big deal like all this shit's already in the game now it's like whatever but you have to remember like in the context of it being 2004 or 2005 people didn't have these expectations of games yet people just weren't you know used to seeing these kinds of things so whenever blizzard would do something like this it was really cool oops imagine sitting down to a cup of hot chocolate, logging in, defeating the Grinch while taking in the atmosphere, both in Azeroth yeah. and outside. It all had a festive spark. It's the touches like this that, while not unique, were delivered in such a light-hearted way for World of Warcraft that it never really broke the immersion of the world, but added a lot of character to the experience. Sure, a lot of the Blizzard events would feel a little bit silly, but they always ended up feeling distinct and in-universe. Immersion in Azeroth and its familiar customs, I think, was only heightened by events like like this i always thought the dumbest fucking event was the turkey event the thanksgiving event there's no fucking point to it like i i, I it, it's just it's there's no fucking point it's like you buy food that's not even good and it's like you just sit around there. There's like there's like one or two items that you were supposed to get but besides that the point is to give thanks well, I guess next time around we can give thanks to Blizzard for whenever they add a storm out during Thanksgiving, right? That way all the kids can spend their Christmas money on it. And it served to foster a deep love that many people have with the world. But of course, vanilla was an interesting time, and the minor system changes in this Probably patch right are fascinating bits, to look it. back on. A fundamental change was made, where players would receive credit for killing a monster even if they died in battle. And this was not a bug yep. fix either, this was a genuine design shift. Imagine dying in group content and not getting credit for the boss kill. Rating would be an entirely <laughs> that different would suck, if dude. Not for this change. In fact, I can see that would it now. That would suck, dude. Imagine like you get the debuff from Veil. It's like, hey, sorry, bro. Like, imagine there's two DPS warriors in the raid, and like they both need the helm of rage or endless rage, right? For because they're dumb, they don't have lion or helm. And you see the other warrior get the fucking debuff. You're so happy. You're like, ha, fuck you, idiot. I I don't know. I just feel like that'd be so great. Yeah, dying. Well, I mean, to be fair, if you die in MC, you probably don't deserve gear.
20 something hunter you'd have heard of an amazing quality blue bow found in the whaling cavern so you would yep. have spent a while in the barren setting up a group you and your new friends would have went through all those confusing tunnels and after clearing a few bosses and beating the real challenge the infamous yep. jump you'd end up fighting lord serpentis yeah. and right as he got his low health in your excitement you take one step too far back and verdon the ever living would have killed you and you'd be dead you would not have got credit for the kill and when venom strike finally dropped the warrior would have got it with their greed roll. A hey. pretty distressing way to ruin an evening for pretty sure. Greed. And there's no way you'd be playing with that warrior uh, ever again out of a mixture of anger and shame. Thankfully, though, this is not something that remained an issue in the game for very long and really was not much of an issue once raiding actually kicked off. Patch 1.2 also added the ability to purchase other racial mounts at Exalted Reputation, which offered players a chance to go a little bit off script and ride whatever they wanted, yeah. provided, of course, they put the effort in. Gnomes it's a could lot escape of effort. their dreaded Meccano Striders, the noise of which drove many people to madness and Torrin could hop on orcs wolves increasing so their chances of actually making it through doors. all the engineering there mounts are annoying to hear restrictions though as blizzard did want to keep the game just not looking too silly Torin could not ride skeletal steeds or raptors given their size and only gnomes could ride the meccano striders the Mysteries of Moradon also implemented the Looking for Group channel, so the players could quickly uncover those mysteries by finding a group in major cities without clogging up general or trade chat. Although, being real, it did little to stem that tide. No, Many players nothing. opted to use trade chat for absolutely everything anyway, be that trading or spreading accusations of ninja looting. Or, most importantly, spreading the word and gospel of our god emperor, Donald Trump. Okay? Like if you're on a Kelth if you're on Kelthazad server and you look at trade chat, it's about Donald Trump. Like that's it. That's all they talk about. All day, all night, everything. Donald Trump. That's it. And, and like it used to be a lot worse, because now you have like the right click report silence thing. But before that happened, holy fuck, that's all people would get into. Before we get on to the more incremental changes though, there's a portent of the future here. The patch notes say this, additional improvements in looking for group functionality will be added in future patches. Bold of Blizzard to call them improvements, but that's not going to be covered till the next episode, so hold tight. What? For now though, let's go through a ton of the smaller fixes and adjustments in patch 1.2. Okay. The game was just so different back then that examining these really just gives us a window into the design of the time. Some of them show off how supremely rough World of Warcraft was at this time, especially in the player experience side. First off, this patch made it so the players afflicted by hibernate, fear, and sap had an increasing chance to break free as the effect went on, so that it would last for about 15 seconds. Now, the variance on the bad end... That's not true. Okay, the... The time that fear breaks is direct, directly proportional to when you need it to break so if it's okay if you like let's say if you're playing a warlock the fear breaks at one second but if you just got feared by a warlock you're running around for 15. that's just the way that it works it was really rough prior to this resulting oh, that's in Drake a very dog. frustrating experience when playing oh shit. a crowd control class Although even with this change and uh, hey, soul today, fire, man. Warlocks did remain to be a pretty frustrating and frightening opponent. Yeah, we then have some glaring sucked. balance issues being looked at here, the most egregious of which being the Druid Bear form, where the armor bonus needed to be almost tripled in order for them to be an effective tank. And even at that, they still did take Holy more damage shit. than warriors did. In fact, this is a fundamental difference that resulted in a lot of very interesting composition choices. You see, back in this iteration of World of Warcraft class design, hybrids could sometimes actually handle multiple roles, albeit not as effectively as a pure class. Yeah. Druids were especially good at this. They had bear tanking and cat DPS under the one feral combat tree. And That's actually a good point. Yeah, I agree was with that. that. Druids could be used Shit. as a flexible off tank when necessary okay. and then otherwise perform cat DPS duties. This okay. worked well for emergency situations and led to some interesting raid strategies and they also had a backup mana pool to throw around some heals too. But of course the other side of that was that really they weren't going to be your main tank as much. Now, as for some other interesting balance changes affecting warriors, spell reflection was originally able to reflect abilities, not just spells, which I'm- Wait, what? Like, spell reflect- wait. Warriors? Warriors didn't get spell reflection until level 64. What? No, they added spell reflect in BC. 
I remember this very clearly. You got it at level 64. We'll see how, how this is going to go. Okay, Sparry Fucked is 100% Burning Crusade. Yeah. Um, well, let's see here. Sure resulted in some very interesting PvP situations, like rogues cheap shotting themselves. Keep in mind, though, at this point in the game, you could not see buffs on enemies without a mage's detect magic. So yeah. even if you were wary of spell reflect, you still might be caught off guard if you miss the animation. Still on the topic of warriors, Mortal Strike was changed from dealing percentage damage to being weapon damage and a flat amount. Something that uh, could have gone very wrong if it was not that way. Because if you had a whole bunch of warriors and Mortal Strike was just doing four to five percent hp as damage well let's just say bosses would not last very long that sounds Wizard great would not implement yeah that's awesome flat percentage damage mechanic again now in return for these nerfs warriors were granted pummel a melee interrupt oh. and this actually meant that warriors could double interrupt with shield bash and pummel if yep. they had the macro set up to put on a shield bash oh, and then go back to their usual weapon during oh my combat God. then over on the economical side of things wow. it's hard to find exact numbers but it seems that fishing was a little bit too lucrative in the early days Mm -hmm. Blizzard reduced the selling price of fished items and reduced the chance of getting greens while it's probably fishing. just for bots, it also I'd assume. did not require a minimum level to pick up, and this meant that a low level character could max out fishing pretty quickly and earn a ton of money. They would, of course, just have to it's progress for while bots, avoiding mobs in the higher level zones. It's an FPS. Basically, That's how you know it's fishing real. was just a little bit overlooked and it needed to be reined in. Quality of life As for changes. general player convenience, there were some positive changes in 1-2, but okay. they weren't free. Druids and priests who were tired of buffing their group with Mark of the Wild or Power of Fortitude individually, they were given a new option. Oh yeah, the Greater Fortitude. Buffs. They didn't just log in though to find yeah. these powerful, lovely, handy new spells. Yeah, you no, needed the stupid items for it too. Through an item drop. In yep. this case, it was a book that would teach you the spell. For yep. elite mobs and bosses. Uh, wasn't that an AQ? I'm pretty sure that was an AQ, right? In ZG? I don't know about CG, but I know it was an AQ. Above the mid 40 level range, there was a tiny chance that the spell book would drop, allowing Shit. a priest or a druid to Holy use reagent, candles and wild berries. Dude, I haven't even thought about to these. buff an entire party at once. EBRS. Super handy, but sadly for Shit. mages with their arcane intellect, or worse still, for the paladins who granted blessings with only a five minute <laughs> cooldown, buffing players was still a decently laborious process. Yeah. Of course, not that every druid or priest had access to these tomes, as while they were sellable on the auction house, given the nature of the game at this time, I'd say a huge percentage of people playing those classes didn't even know what to look for. While having to find people are stupid or back secret then. knowledge to learn new techniques was great for the RPG feeling of the game, the mystery of sure was also altered class fantasy for great. one particular class, Warlocks. Demons were now given random names from a huge selection based on type, although in exchange they lost something that was extremely unintentional but ended up aiding the class fantasy of Warlocks being pretty scary. Yeah. They lost the ability to kill players during Jewels, uh, the result of something between pet casts not being cancelled and dot damage coming in at the same time. I like that. that. Jewels one HP. I like that. There it is. Ended. So that's an odd thing that happened. They were yeah, just killed the people in the duel. It's easy. Toolkit, even without the looming fear of death and the subsequent corpse run. Beyond that, though, this patch ultimately did not change a lot. It fixed a laundry list of issues with items and quests, ranging from reducing the amount of kills needed for a quest or ensuring that some items had the correct stats. There were little UI changes that made life a bit easier, like arrows in the minimap being easier to see. Plus, they added an in-game toggle menu for add-ons, but really, it didn't change the landscape of Azeroth. It iterated on it and improved it. So, all in all, patch 1.2 was mostly carried by came out on that patch. That was many, the big thing. Fixes. It was, however, only six weeks after launch, which is an update cadence that basically no developer could match today. As for whether this trend would six continue, weeks well, after the next launch. patch would not be for almost That's three actually true. months. In terms of the subscription fee, that would be like paying for, well, essentially an expansion pack. Would it be worth it? Well, tune into the next episode to find out as we look at more design changes that would change the game greatly and traverse the ruins of Dire Mall. Holy so there you go. Shit, that is episode man. two of our patch retrospective series. If you'd like to help us out with this series, the best way to do that is over on Patreon. And if you go for the $25 tier, then uh, we will be sending physical things to you for the month of August. That does um, also involve two bonus items that I think uh, you'll find to be pretty cool. Bonus? And, uh, does yeah, that mean it's tight? Titans Forge, oh boy! Patron, they really do make Fuck, dude. Series uh, watch the Maradon. She's too fat for me, Machinima. I, I don't know about that. The video actually was.
every single one of these, man. Like, it, it, every single one. I mean, it's not even like, oh, sometimes it doesn't. It's like every day this happens. Every fucking day. I, I just, okay, grass on 500k, dude. Oh, wait, did, oh, Bellure hit 500,000 subs. Holy shit. Congrats, damn, that's big. That's really fucking big. Uh, the Warriors and I have function in vanilla is introduced in TVC. Yeah, it's not really a big deal. Um, absolutely loving the series so far. I like this series a lot, too. Like, going through, as well, will smile while watching this video and hype people up for classic. Big true. Big fucking true. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to it a lot. More every single day. Uh, why don't you ever talk about the idea of buying expansions? Uh, what is this here? Uh, when there are sub fees, uh, expansions should be included. Uh, I mean, should isn't really a word that I usually like to use, but um, uh, in my opinion, I don't think buying an expansion is that big of a deal. And uh, especially the fact that the sub fee hasn't increased over the last 15 years. Uh, I don't really have a tr I don't have trouble trouble buying an expansion if uh, if the sub fee's been the same, right? And uh, I, I think that's basically the way that I look at it.